The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Our first presentation this afternoon will be by Timothy Wangler from ETH Zurich, who will be talking about the digital concrete work they are doing at ETH Zurich. Hi, my name is uh, Timothy Wengler. I'm uh, uh, working as senior researcher at ETH Zurich. I'm a senior researcher in the group of Professor Robert Flatt, who's uh, leading most, of, who's leading all the work on uh, digital concrete at ETH Zurich that you might be familiar with. Uh, and there's a, a whole host of names up here. Uh, maybe some names to highlight include uh, uh, Fabio Bramazio and Matthias Kohler, who are the uh, sort of pioneers from architecture in this, uh, as well as uh, Anna Yorit and uh, PhD student Lex uh, Ryder, as well as Norman Hack, all working on the various projects which I'll show to you. So uh, architecture today is defined by uh, things such as uh, vertical walls, flat slabs and sharp corners, and that's because of how we build things, right? Uh, basically, architecture is limited more by the uh, by our building method rather than by uh, what we can actually construct thanks to formwork eating up the lion's share of the cost. That's why even uh, the moment that things get non-standard uh, it gets much worse. This is the uh, the Rolex Center at EPFL in Lausanne. Very uh, nice uh, undulating structure. Uh, quite beautiful. But to construct it required custom formwork. So to construct this you have to make new formwork that you can't reuse. In the end it just gets tossed. This is a pile of that formwork, so things get a lot worse. Uh, your wallet, as well as for the environment, when things get non-standard. So uh, I'm going to shamelessly borrow a, a video that uh, Robert liked to introduce to illustrate the concept of digital fabrication and how important it is. We both have little girls, and uh, you, I really couldn't let the opportunity pass, and I'm sure Robert would feel the same way to uh, play Frozen at Disney uh, to illustrate how digital fabrication really opens up the, the chance to you basically put your imagination into architecture uh, because you're uh, just like Elsa there are so many similarities to digital fabrication with concrete there's seemingly limitless architectural freedom uh, there's no cumbersome formwork to deal with you're putting material only where it's needed uh, which means you get a lot, uh, you're building more structurally efficient uh, structures uh, using less material, it's better for the environment, um, as well as reducing the amount of waste from the formwork. Uh, just like us, uh, Elsa is uh, eliciting a phase change control to produce structures. She's I, presumably pulling uh, water vapor from the air, turning it into ice. Uh, we are taking concrete, very useful material because it flows and then it can uh, fill a formwork and then set and barrel load, right? And uh, like uh, many folks in digital fabrication up until now with concrete, Elsa, we're dealing with a brittle material here. So probably you should start thinking about the reinforcement, and this is something that you should probably start thinking about with concrete, uh, digital fabrication with concrete from the outset, because it does impact your process. So the uh, this is all coming about from the advent of the so-called third industrial revolution, the first being the one that you're familiar with from your history books, starting Great Britain, uh, and then the second one being classified as the era of mass production, uh, start, uh, kicked, our, uh, kicked off by Henry Ford around the turn of the 20th century. And the third one is the so-called era of mass customization, uh, uh, where basically you can uh, go direct from a design, whatever you design, to a uh, uh, to spit it out uh, in an additive manufacturing process. And on the con construction level, it's possible thanks to great advances in robotic technology in the past uh, decades, uh, past decade or so. So this was all inspiration to start the uh, National Center of Competence and Research for Digital Fabrication and Architecture. This, this was really being led by those folks I mentioned earlier, Fabio Bramante and Matthias Kohler. Mm -hmm. 
and this is the largest funding mechanism uh, for the Swiss National F Science Foundation. It's about to start its second phase. These numbers are dated. They're actually bigger, uh, the amount in, uh, of, the, uh, of the personnel involved in this. And from a, from a uh, storytelling perspective, in ETH Zurich, uh, we noticed around, uh, I think it was the SEC meeting in Washington, D.C. a year and a half or so ago, the, the sudden interest in this. We thought, okay, let's publish a paper in the new Rowland Technical uh, uh, Letters Journal generated a whole lot of interest and so we said all right uh, let's uh, with the next uh, Rowland Technical Committee meeting uh, the technical committee of course that uh, Nicola Roussel spoke about earlier we said let's uh, let's do a workshop uh, we've we've initially thought uh, we're gonna get all the people involved in digital fabrication with concrete uh, so uh, it's gonna be something small for the PhD students but it turns out uh, that we were able to invite uh, more names and pioneering names in uh, digital fabrication and generated a, really a whole lot of interest and we uh, we could see the burgeoning interest in this which led us to uh, and this is the advertising part uh, led us to decide to host a conference at, in Zurich and so the extended abstract uh, outline for this is the end of the month though, so we're still accepting abstracts for this and we encourage you to submit abstracts it'll be next year in September uh, from the 10th to the 12th the first day on the 9th will be from PhD workshops in, uh, in Zurich, and the, and the great thing about it is it's being held uh, at the same time as the uh, Rob Arch uh, conference, uh, which is uh, robotics and architecture, it's the biggest robotics and architecture conference uh, that's held. Uh, it will be in Zurich beginning at the end of our conference, and uh, they'll be running workshops in parallel with our conference as well. So it'll be a nice chance for some crazy architects to interact with uh, some of you folks if you decide to come. We, we're actually really quite looking forward to that. Uh, being in uh, ETH Zurich means we're not starved for resources. The NCCR uh, allows us to have nice production facilities such as this robotic fabrication laboratory, which is a huge uh, place to test out prefabrication concepts. Just beginning some concrete work on the process of smart dynamic casting, which I'll be showing you later, actually. One of the uh, flagship process, uh, projects of the first phase of the NCCR will be the so-called so nest building, which is a, a modular building. It's a series of slabs at the materials testing, federal materials testing facility in Dubendorf, which is close to, uh, close to ETH in Zurich. And it's a bunch of slabs with uh, modules for different uh, testing of different building technologies. And we have one on the, uh, on the corner here called the DFAB house, where we'll have different uh, technologies showcased uh, that have been developed in the NCCR in the first phase. Uh, three dimension here are uh, that are going to involve concrete to some degree. Smart slab, which is 3D printed. I won't actually uh, be uh, talking about that one uh, very much, but the uh, SDC facade and Williams, SDC being smart dynamic casting, and the uh, mesh mold wall. These are the, the, these are the projects that are involved in uh, digital concrete at ETH. Uh, we do very limited work and it's preliminary work on extrusion, so I won't speak about that. Uh, and some of the faces involved. This is Anna uh, Jorit and uh, Lex Ryder uh, for the uh, Smart Dynamic Casting project, uh, very important to that. And uh, of course, Norman Hack, who is the uh, lead ar architect of the mesh mold. So the, uh, the first project that I'll be, uh, or the first uh, area that we'll, I'll talk about that we're doing at ETH Zurich is called 3D printing of complex architectural components led by uh, digital building technologies and Professor Benjamin Dillenberger from Architecture. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used a, uh, so this uh, powder bed printing process that was showcased earlier by Dirk Lofka. They use a different binder. They use a, uh, an organic binder to bind particles of sand. And the idea there was to print a lost formwork, basically printing uh, formworks. But this is a nice project to showcase a couple of nice things about digital fabrication with concrete. They used a very uh, simple topological optimization algorithm to take a slab element and reduce a load, a, uh, the material content of the slab element by 70% for a specific loading case. Uh, and of course, them being architects, they wanted it to look pretty cool. So uh, the challenge from our side was basically how to infill this, uh, this formwork. Uh, as you recall how the process works, you've got to remove the loose sand. That was a huge challenge, removing the sand from some of these uh, channels seen here. And then we infilled it with a ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete seen here. And uh, the infill process was uh, successful. 
uh, the architects did a uh, architecture uh, loading test. Uh, we'll test it uh, in a more traditional way eventually, but we would like to scan it first to, uh, with X-ray micro CT to, uh, to see any holes. Uh, piggybacking off of this, most recently, uh, every year, I guess, uh, I suppose uh, civil engineers are familiar with concrete canoe competitions, and the German Civil Engineering Student Association also does concrete canoe competitions, uh, and ETH always enters them with the aim to win the, uh, the construction prize, and uh, we've been using digital fabrication to do that for the past, uh, past couple of rounds, and this was uh, no different. So we did this with uh, digital building technologies, and they used uh, 3D printing. Well, first they did, they used a topological optimization algorithm to produce a skeleton-like structure for a canoe uh, and printed it using FDM, so this is PLA printing in pieces and it had to be pieced together and fused using solvent welding to, uh, uh, to get the plastic pieces to stick together to finally produce a canoe uh, with uh, holes in it. So this is the uh, so-called skeleton of the canoe. It, re it had to be infilled with the same ultra high uh, performance fiber reinforced concrete as you can imagine. Uh, if my video would play, the, the, uh, the big challenge in this was to get the, uh, uh, this is a weak formwork obviously and you're going to build up a lot of uh, uh, formwork pressure that causes it to burst very quickly and so we controlled it by using sand so we just buried this in this sarcophagus uh, and filled it with uh, the video which show the infill process and the, uh, we, we managed to successfully infill it, uh, although there were a couple of bursts under the sand, so we had a couple of tumors to remove. But uh, it was a successful process, of course, it has to float, so we covered it in a, a, a textile skin and used a, a super fluid cement paste uh, painted onto it to provide the water tightness, uh, and uh, it uh, did actually win the construction price. So, <clears throat> on to what is uh, basically the uh, I guess the, the flagship project really of, uh, of, uh, prof of Professor Flat's group, which is Smart Dynamic Casting. We've started it uh, about five years ago, um, like six now. And Smart Dynamic Casting is a, ah, video works great. So Smart Dynamic Casting is a scaled down version of slip forming uh, to produce uh, complex shapes where the, uh, you have this formwork. The formwork can be rigid or it can be flexible as you see later. Uh, you input or you pump in material that is highly retarded, so we use uh, sugar to retard the material and have a huge open time, and then it gets accelerated right at the casting point uh, so that we control the hydration right when it comes out. And this is affected through chemical admixtures. Here's a, here's a schematic of the process because the schematic is important as it shows that we're also performing measurements uh, in, in, offline and inline to monitor the strength, uh, the structure buildup. The inline measurement is a formwork pressure measurement uh, that still needs to be perfected. And offline, we use penetration on uh, uh, sample uh, samples of material that are pulled off. Um, the uh, the acceler again, the accelerator is added at the point of casting uh, uh, to a retarded self-compacting uh, mortar. The reason why it's so important is because <clears throat> uh, if you imagine the, uh, the early stages of strength build up right at the onset of acceleration, if you come out of the formwork while it's too soft, you get a cow pie and material flow out. But uh, if you come out, if you let it sit in the formwork for a little too long and you're in this region, then you build up too much friction between the, uh, the formwork and the material and you get column ripoff. And so you have to stay in this very tight window within five to ten minutes, actually, of the, uh, the early strength development uh, of the uh, material. And to do that, you, have to, you absolutely have to control it using chemical admixtures in our case. Yeah, the way, uh, so the concept that's, that was uh, introduced by Lex is basically putting con uh, concrete to sleep and waking it up. Uh, Lex made these nice animations showing the cement surface with sucrose, so that's the green guys. Uh, stuck to the cement surface, they absorbed to the cement surface, and one way to wake the, uh, uh, the, wake the concrete up and start hydration is to introduce a surface that maybe could be a bit more attractive, like this cool guy who is the uh, uh, calcium hydroxide surface, to pull the sucrose away. And there's other ways of doing it, uh, act using active accelerators uh, and accelerating which uh, uh, phase depends on what accelerator you're using. 
Uh, one very nice benefit of this process is it lends itself quite well to reinforcement uh, because you can just slip around the reinforcement and that is the strategy for these facade mullions that are going to be in the in the nest building uh, which will be uh, uh, put it they're under production right now actually I mentioned flexible formats which are required for producing these mullions and that's seen in this video here uh, in the production of one of these uh, facade mullions. Uh, one of the great things about this, uh, I think in terms of showcasing the potential for digital fabrication is what I mentioned earlier, the ability to put material right where you, uh, right, right where you want it. So for this particular loading case, it's uh, important to have more material in the middle uh, as it will be bearing uh, wind loads. So uh, the last process that I'll be talking about is the mesh mold. Uh, the mesh mold, the idea behind that is basically started off as a, uh, uh, the idea of a lost formwork, a formwork that will serve both as formwork and reinforcement. Uh, and it started off with basically doing a spatial extrusion of, uh, of plastic. Of course, uh, Norman Heck being a, an architect, he needed some folks to say to him, look, you need to use some real reinforcement, right? This is not gonna work. So he moved on to steel packaging wire. And uh, he, the, the robotic tool head that bends, cuts, and welds this uh, uh, steel packaging wire worked really quite well. But again, when we brought in the structural engineers, they said, look, there's not enough steel there uh, for this to be a structurally viable element. We needed it to go into the nest house because people will, will live in it. So they offered the possibility to either increase the mesh density or increase the rebar diameter. Uh, so Norman came back and said, well, the rate limiting step is, uh, our, uh, is the number of weld points. And in fact, by changing the, uh, the rebar diameter, you can get a time savings factor uh, to the fourth power. So by doing that, we just said, okay, yeah, let's just increase the rebar diameter, diameter to exactly what we need. But then the robotics guys said, wait a second, you know, mechatronically speaking, it's, if you increase the diameter too much, then the power requirements are going to increase. Uh, that are going to be on this tool head that has a set payload. So it was a, uh, it was a really cool and honestly a fun negotiating process uh, that highlights something I think is very important uh, uh, that you have to get into early from the outset if you want to get into this business, which is to be interdisciplinary. Because none of this would have worked without the input of all these varying dif disciplines. And if you want to do something that's going to be useful structurally, and make sense from a process point of view as well. You need to involve everybody from the from the outset. Uh, it turned out to it's turned out to be really quite successful. The, the nest wall is is uh, constructed. We're waiting to fill it with concrete. This uh, this video shows you the construction of a of a mock up of the uh, of the nest uh, for the mesh mold wall. I might have to have to zip through it because I got a couple of minutes here. So this is the the fabrication process. Nicholas showed it also earlier. Uh, showing the uh, robotic tool head that's bending uh, and cutting and welding, the uh, reinforcement. Uh, let's see, and then we get to the concrete filling process, which is uh, worth worth uh, taking a look at. So the concrete filling process this is a pretty cool concept. Uh, uh, a few concepts that came up, but one of the uh, concepts that we tested was the so-called uh, we call it the spaghetti and meatballs mix, which is a self-compacting uh, concrete. Uh, and obviously if it's uh, self-compacting, it's very low yield stress, it can flow out. But if you use very large aggregates, um, which uh, we did, then it jams and it can stay in the, uh, in the mesh by, uh, by jamming. Uh, obviously you have problems with stability there, so we opted for density matching the aggregate to the, uh, to the paste to control the uh, stability of the mix. Uh, it's finished later by, uh, by uh, a shotcrete layer and a manual finish here by uh, one of our uh, contractors that we work with. Uh, and here's the assembled mock-up showing the SDC columns over on the left uh, here uh, with the mesh mold wall here and a uh, 3D printed wall up top. It's quite a successful project uh, for us, won the Swiss Technology Award, which is really quite a big thing for a construction project. So the key takeaways really from that we've been uh, 
from all the, pro the varying projects that we've been dealing with, uh, one of the main things is, of course, rheology being key, and especially hydration control. You need to be able to control structure buildup somehow, either through continuous mixing or uh, more, maybe more ideally through a chemical admixture. You have to monitor the structural buildup, uh, and I, most ideally it's done online, so there's all sorts of uh, folks in the uh, uh, Rylum Technical Committee that are looking at uh, metrology methods for monitoring structural control. Folks have already talked to Arno Perro mentioned a lot about uh, processing windows and getting these uh, will be paramount. You'll see these in further presentations uh, from, uh, from folks from Europe also. And uh, mixing and admixtures are going to be quite important later on. Arno also mentioned already cold joints versus collapse, so I don't need to go into detail on that. Uh, reinforcement is important if you want to get into this and to think about it from the outset, how it's going to impact your process. And uh, maybe you can even get up, start thinking about uh, not having any reinforcement with compression-only structures. We've got a, a colleague, an architecture colleague in ETH, who's uh, really into that. Uh, and I think, in the end, uh, as, uh, as Nicola mentioned, uh, maybe we'll just have to rethink reinforcement for this type of uh, material. And last but not least, we should really not forget durability. I haven't already mentioned yet, but maybe cold joints are not such a big deal in some cases in terms of mechanical uh, strength, but this, these could form uh, potential channels for aggressive agents to find their way into your structure and attack your reinforcement. But last but not least, is interdisciplinarity. Again, I really want to highlight that. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll leave my advertising slide up last. <laughs>